In the last video, you guys have roasted me in the comment section where I made a case about how Bitcoin could go to zero or to a million, but it doesn't matter because at the end of the day, Bitcoin is a tiny part of the blockchain. Whether Bitcoin succeeds or not, blockchain will still be the technology that will govern in the future. But it seems like a big chunk of you disagrees with me, but it doesn't matter because today we are going to discuss the mother of all crashes as Michael Burry calls it. Some people don't like Michael Burry because he believes that the entire crypto is in a bubble and it is going to crash together with meme stocks. If it was a random person like me, then you could call him dumb, stupid and whatever you want. But this guy is so smart that Hollywood made an entire movie about him. The fact that Hollywood made a movie about him doesn't make him smart. But since he has predicted precisely the 2008 crash and earned hundreds of millions of dollars in the process has gained him the reputation of a financial genius who can predict crashes. Isn't that awesome? If you can know for sure that what will crash and what will rise, you're destined to make millions. While hedge funds who shorted Tesla lost millions of dollars, guess who profited by shorting Tesla? Yes, the man himself, Michael Burry. Barry shorted over 800,000 shares or $534 million by the end of the first quarter of this year and tweeted about it. Guess what happened to Tesla stock? It dropped to around $600. Since he started his hedge fund in the 2000s, he immediately made extraordinary profits. In his first full year in the 2001, the S&P 500 fell 11.88%. Sign was up 55%. Barry achieved these returns by shorting overvalued tech stocks at the peak of the internet bubble. The next year, the S&P 500 fell again by 22%, and yet sign was up again 16%. The next year, in 2003, the stock market finally turned around and rose 28.7%, but Mike Barry beat it again. His investment rose by 50%. By the end of the 2004, Mike Barry was managing $600 million and turning money away. In 2005, Barry started to focus on the subprime market. Throughout his analysis of mortgage lending practices in 2003 and 2004, he predicted that the real estate bubble would collapse as early as 2007. Eventually, he was right. The market crashed, he earned a personal profit of $100 million and earned another $700 million for his investors. Just imagine how happy his investors were. Everyone lost money while well, they made an incredible return of almost 500%. He also predicted that Bitcoin price is too high before it crashed to around $30,000. In fact, he specifically said that if you don't know how much leverage is involved in the run-up, you might not know enough to own it. Many of you are going to dislike this video because of what I'm about to say. But instead, if all of you are going to give this video a thumbs up, I'm going to explain why leverage is so important in understanding Bitcoin, why exactly Michael Burry thinks that the mother of all crashes is coming and whether we should trust him or not. To understand the problem with modern economy, you have to understand leverage. We have created so many creative forms of debt that no one really knows how big is that debt. And Warren Buffett even called it financial weapons of mass distractions. It's a ticking bomb. When it explodes, it can take down the entire economy. But why do we use leverage in the first place? Because leverage turns good deals into great deals. Imagine you certainly believe that stock A is going to rise by 50% the next day. You can use your $10,000 to buy stock A and let's assume you are right and the stock price rises by 50%. Congrats! You have made $5,000. But if you have used leverage, let's say 10 to 1, you would have purchased $100,000 worth of stock A and would have earned $50,000 after returning the borrowed $90,000 once it rises by 50%. But that's a simple example because most of the leverage is in form of derivatives. A derivative is basically a contract between two parties betting on the change of a price of an asset. This contract derives its value from underlying assets such as gold, oil, stocks or pretty much anything. Literally anything. And that's why it's called 
a derivative. If we bet on the price of the oil, for example, and create a derivative, as the oil price changes due to geopolitical factors, the price of that derivative changes accordingly. Let's say your friend wants to sell his Pokemon card six months from now, and you desperately want that card. You tell your friend, I will buy your card for a hundred dollars if you promise me that you will sell it only to me. You create a contract, sign it, and congrats, you have created a derivative. But it's not as simple as that, because guys in fancy suits in Wall Street have complicated the matter. Let's say five months passes and some famous YouTubers start making videos about their Pokemon cards, and the price of that Pokemon card shoots to a thousand dollars, but he already promised to sell it to you for a hundred dollars. Since you're not sure whether a month from now this card will be valued at a thousand dollars, you decide to sell your part of the contract to someone who is more desperate for two hundred dollars. Now your friend is obligated to sell his card to him since he has purchased your part of the contract and you earned two hundred dollars. And that is called a forward contract, it's a zero sum game. Your friend could have earned an extra nine hundred dollars, but instead he's stuck in a contract with you to sell it for a hundred dollars. That's why we have options. Your friend will give you five dollars when signing the contract for giving him the right to cancel this contract. He doesn't have to cancel the contract, but he has the right to exercise that option. That's why it's called option, because you have an option. The price of the card rises to a thousand dollars, your friend cancels the contract with you and sells it for a thousand dollars instead of a hundred dollars to you, but you have earned at least five dollars for taking that risk. But if it doesn't, you're still obligated to buy that card for a hundred dollars. That sounds unfair. That's why we have call options. Your friend is obligated to sell the card to you no matter what, but you have the option to cancel the contract at any moment. But in return, you have to pay your friend five dollars for having that option. Simple, right? In order to save time, most derivatives use standardized terms. They're called futures. 587 barrels of oil at $50 per barrel that expires at this date. If oil prices rise to $60, your future becomes more valuable, and vice versa. Oil prices drop to $40, your future becomes less valuable. You may wonder, why on earth do we have so many complicated contracts? Let's say you run an airline. In order to keep your airline profitable, you need to budget, and with oil prices jumping every day, you can't do that, but using options, you can secure the price for an entire year for a little fee. If oil prices rise, they can even make a profit. But that's one use for it. The other is that you can profit by speculating. And the best part of it is that you don't even need to have the money to do that, since all you need to do is to buy put options. On top of that, this market is not even regulated because of the Commodity Futures Modernization Act of the 2000 that Bill Clinton signed. That's why this market has grown to 1.2 quadrillion dollars. In comparison, the world GDP is just 84 trillion dollars. We can't even regulate the market now because it's simply too big. Any regulations could result in a collapse of the world economy. In fact, the 2008 crash was caused by derivatives. Wait a second, how derivatives caused the 2008 crash? Here is the story in short. The fact that millions of people couldn't pay their mortgages was just the tip of the iceberg. When giving mortgages, banks bundled these loans together and sold them as securities to investors, which is not a problem. But then companies like AIG started betting on these mortgage-backed securities. They insured those securities by creating derivatives that say, if the borrowers would default on their mortgages, we're going to reimburse you, which made these mortgage-backed securities risk-free. But in return, you will pay AIG a small premium for taking that risk. AIG believed that house prices will keep rising, so it was a great investment. So AIG, together with other financial institutions, created derivatives insuring all other mortgage-backed securities in the market. On the other side, there were people who created derivatives that bet against these mortgage-backed securities. In fact, there were even derivatives that bet against derivatives that bet for mortgage-backed securities. 
and companies that believe that home prices will keep rising did accept these contracts since they would earn money out of nothing. But the moment house prices started declining, financial institutions suddenly had to pay everyone they promised, but didn't have the money to do that. All the companies that bet against the housing market didn't even need the money to bet against the market. All they needed is to afford to pay the premiums, and they could bet tens of billions of dollars. And that's the problem with derivatives. You can make a deal without having the money to back it. And that's what led this market to worth $1.2 quadrillion. If it collapses, it will get way worse than the 2008 crash, since back in 2008, this market was only worth $600 trillion. That's why it's not enough to understand the asset, but you should know how much leverage is used. In the case of crypto, for example, traders are using up to 100 to 1 leverage ratios, which means with just $1,000, they're taking positions worth $100,000, which means if something slightly goes wrong, the entire thing could collapse no matter how loudly you say the word decentralized. Theoretically, it could happen, but theoretically, it might not. But if it happens, at least you will not freak out because now you know how derivatives work. And if you want to learn more about the stock market, then check out my course on Skillshare. And don't forget to get your two free stocks from Webull. Thanks for watching and until next time.